Great. Uh, welcome, everybody. I am pleased to get to have this conversation with, with you today around uh, Business Legacies, which is this initiative that asks the question of, you know, if you're thinking about social enterprise as an option, what is the option and the opportunity to acquire one? So as um, we start, I would like to just acknowledge that this is a project that has been underway for about a year and a half. Um, we really want to recognize our amazing partner, Royal Roads, who's been doing the research and the base of this um, in order to build a really good toolkit and resources and programming to support organizations and individuals who are looking to acquire and transition businesses into social enterprises. And some of our funders, which include the Island Coastal Economic Trust, um, British Columbia and Vancouver Foundation. So, and then all the partners that you can see at the bottom of the slide who have contributed through advisory group and support and, you know, freely giving of their expertise. So it's been a real privilege to do this project and we continue to do it for the next couple of years as we grow and explore this as an option. Um, I'm Christy Fairholm Mater. I'm with Scale Collaborative. I'm coming to you today from the unceded territories of the Ligwankan speaking peoples um, in Southern Vancouver Island. Um, and that's the Esquimalt and Songhees nations. And I'm with Scale Collaborative and Scale Collaborative is an organization that works to build a strong social impact sector um, on Vancouver Island and beyond. And that includes working with impact organizations to help them become more financially resilient and enterprising, as well as a strong social economy in the region that includes social procurement and social finance, including recently having launched a impact investment fund called Thrive Impact Fund. Alec, do you wanna introduce yourself? Absolutely. Uh, I'm Alec Wheeler, and I am the coordinator with the Business Legacies Initiative. Um, and uh, I hail from the Duncan Cowichan area on Vancouver Island, uh, and have been with the project uh, for about a year now. Great, thank you. So just some review of our, our day today, we are going to use the chat box. So we like to have people engage, um, <laughs> you know, lots of smiles and waves and sometimes, you know, putting up thumbs or we might ask for that. We will ask you to unmute yourself if you want to talk, um, but otherwise to remain on mute. And we will have a chance to do some breakout rooms and have one chance to, to engage with each other, which is great. We will record the session and send it out afterwards for um, folks who registered and not able to attend. Or if you just want to review it and, and share it out, then feel free. So in the chat, what I would really like for everyone to do is to please put your name and your organization and then to think if there were no barriers that existed in social enterprise what would you what would you want to operate what would be your social enterprise ideal All right, so we have Anne with Thrift Store. Any others? Oh, we've got film production, <laughs> a food social enterprise. We have Food Truck from uh, Brain Injury Society. Thank you, Jordan. Yeah, and so we'll come back to some of those ideas pretty shortly when we talk about what would be possible. So today in our session, we're going to talk about that introduction to business acquisition. What does that look like? We're going to tell a story of an organization that did, um, I'm just catching up on some of those, increased traffic. Excellent. Um, we're going to tell a story of an, of an acquisition of a nonprofit in the region who has acquired recently and will share what their journey has been, some of the tools and processes and resources that are available for acquisition, and then at the end we'll do a quick um, five question eval. So feel free to pop questions as we go into the chat. Um, <clears throat> Alec will monitor the chat and then we can stop and, and engage, but we'll go through sort of like a little bit of sections and then a chance for conversation. So the premise of this is, again, as I mentioned, if you're thinking about social enterprise, there is the opportunity to, instead of start one, is to look at what can be acquired and transitioned into a social enterprise. And 
you know, a lot of social enterprises in the nonprofit world for charities and nonprofits that have been using and advancing social enterprises, which that's been growing for sure over the last decade, um, is that most of the social enterprises that we see is that the startup path has been the primary option that's been provided. And that's usually, a, I mean, my theory is, is that's usually because we have funding that allows and supports startup, right? So we can get funding for grants, you know, grants for like doing business plans or doing pilots or testing or innovation, and that fits itself well for startup. Um, but it becomes more difficult when your organization or your social enterprise begins to grow. Um, it's harder to get resources and financing for that. And for acquisition, you know, you have the challenge is not that the business is going, it already generates revenue. Sometimes the challenge is, is that you have to then access financing to acquire it. So when you think about whether or not you want to start up or acquire, then there's some considerations to take into place. I mean, great thing about startup is it's your idea. You get to mold it into whatever you want it to be. Um, and it can fill a gap in the market that you're uniquely positioned to see. And you can design it specifically for the impact that you want to achieve, and you can access that funding to try and to test. But the challenges around startup is that it, it can be really risky, and that startups are hard, and that the startup space um, has you know, a significant failure rate. And that is, that's true and real, because you're testing and trying and finding your market and finding your customers and making sure that your product or service works. Like there's a lot of learning that takes place in that bit. And it also takes a long time to get to break even. So in the years that you're growing and going through that startup phase, those revenues are quite small and you need to grow your revenues to get to break even. So there is the, you do need to get through that phase to get towards that place and generate the revenues. So around acquisition, you know, these tend to be traditional. And so one of the things that we can see is if your business is a fairly traditional business that you want to do, like a food truck, um, then those are businesses that come up for sale. And so, or a cafe or a restaurant or property management or landscaping, there's a number of businesses that if your business idea is, is something that's more traditional, then there might be an existing business that you can acquire instead. And in which case you begin to see its track record. It already is revenue generating and it already has existing staff that have the capacity. So those are some of the pluses around having, you know, buying an existing business. Um, upfront capital is required. And so the, the, the tension or the tension or the thing that you have to figure out is how do you finance an acquisition? Um, and then, but when you finance that acquisition, you also are essentially having access to the revenue that that acquisition provides. You need to understand why the business is selling. What cycle is it in the business cycle? Is it a business that its time has gone past and it's not a good business buy? You want to get one that's still got some lift and some growth to it and that you'll need to be able to manage change. And that's the change management, both within your own organization, as well as within the business that you're, that you're going to be acquiring and the staff that are there. And the role you know, in a startup, often social enterprises will be within the nonprofit or within the, the parent organization. With an acquisition, the business tends to be outside the parent organization. So it becomes a business that you own. And therefore, there needs to be an oversight process and systems. So those are the considerations around whether or not you want to consider doing a startup social enterprise or an acquisition. And so take a little moment to think, and we want to pop you into breakout groups to have a conversation around this. And we want to say, like, what do you think would be some of the key challenges that might be faced in acquiring a business? And then also to talk about what are some of the strengths that you think would be required or would help to become successful in acquiring and transitioning a business. And you can think about it from your own organizational or personal perspective. What do you think are some of the challenges your organization or you might see in, in acquiring your business? What are some of the strengths or assets that you and your organization bring that would help with that process? So Alex is going to pop you in. We're going to give you probably just in groups of three. So you'll have a chance to have a quick conversation for five minutes. And uh, yeah, we'll go from there. Great. Welcome back. Welcome back. <laughs> so if people could mute, that would be great. Um, except for, I would love to hear um, from maybe someone from each group to just say like, what, just reflect the conversation. What were the challenges and, and strengths or opportunities that you, you touched upon? 
So maybe I will see. <clears throat> um, Karen, how about your group? Someone from Karen's group. Yeah. Um, sure. Uh, sure. Yeah, I think uh, it's interesting. I think we came, all came from um, a little bit of a different angle. Um, we had um, one fellow who has already been uh, involved and uh, is involved in a social enterprise and was considering that acquisition was probably not a good way to go for him based on experience. Um, and then another fellow who has also done a number of social enterprises um, and then uh, one, one, one uh, person who is um, trying to do a more entrepreneurial program within their charity. So, and then myself looking also kind of more from that angle, like how do you do a more entrepreneurial approach within a charity or do you take it outside of the charity? So those were kind of the questions that came up. Great. All right, how about another group? Um, Anne. I knew you were going to say that. Actually, we just talked about what we were all doing and, and our purposes for being here today. So we didn't really get much into the challenges and strengths of acquiring. Mm -hmm. Sorry, we were just chit-chatting. Oh, sometimes that's that's perfect as well. Um, yeah. Aaron and Aaron's group, I think you had you and maybe Zara, Jordan. I'm not sure if there was... I yeah. hopped in for the last three minutes, so I'm going to defer, um, perhaps to, to Jess or um, the other my other team member. I'm sorry, I've forgotten his name. Yeah, great, Jess. Thank you. Yeah, I was with uh, Aaron, Nick, and myself. We sort of span the spectrum: um, long-term care, newcomers, uh, food, and uh, a kitchen social enterprise. So the whole thing. Um, we talked a lot about perseverance, risk, uh, trying new things and not being afraid to do it. So yeah. That was like a tiny bit. Yeah. Um, I might have missed another group. If I've missed your group, feel free to unmute and just share a little bit about your conversation. <clears throat> no, covered everybody. Uh, Cheryl. Um, we did the same as the other group. We kind of introduced ourselves and talked about why we were there and what kind of information we were looking for. And um, uh, one of the folks in our group, uh, Steph, was sharing a little bit about one of the challenges <clears throat> is thinking about um, how you set up the business as a not-for-profit and looking at a social enterprise and how it may be similar or different from a standard business. So we, we yeah. have about that. Great. Okay, well, we'll cover some of that now. So, um, yeah, so when we looked at what the <clears throat> major challenges are to acquisition, um, is that not that is specific to nonprofits? We can see that, you know, the time, we talk about time, culture, and capital were what came up repeatedly. So we have the, the barrier of time, which is often that because nonprofits have a series of decision-making processes and layers of decisions, when you start thinking about acquiring a business as an option, um, being able to pre-think a lot of that allows that when a business does come up for sale, that might be something that's right for your organization, that you're able to move forward, right? Because they the buyers will often have a quicker timeline than it takes for nonprofits to, to go through that. So just taking into consideration what, what needs to happen in order to, to get your organization ready to acquire and own and, and operate a business. Talking about cultures, a lot of nonprofits have um, fairly risk adverse cultures in their board levels and sometimes in their staff levels. And so to think about what is the culture of your organization? What's the risk tolerance of that? And what is also, as we talk about the risk of not doing something. So there's some real different ways of thinking about risk and going through and understanding if your risk is a real risk or if your risk is a perceived risk. So we talk about the risks of should, right? We shouldn't be doing this versus um, really looking and getting down to what is the actual risks around mitigation and understanding that. And then the other barrier is, is, is access to capital. And so being able to line up financing and to be able to make sure that your, your business has the resources it needs to go through a transition and then be able to grow. And so with those, um, we can begin to look at there's also huge opportunity, 
right? And that's where we started like the challenges, the opportunities is that around 40% and we did this for BC. So, and this is, but mimicked across the country around 40% of owners will exit their businesses in the next five years. So we're coming to this really big transition. And that if you're looking at social enterprises that are fairly, again, like fairly traditional, these are the kind of businesses that are coming up for sale, right? And they have long track records and they also serve a fairly big service, you know, uh, role in community, right? And so we see that the potential of these businesses because there is not enough buyers for the businesses. There's a, we have a supply demand issue that's coming up. There's more people that are wanting to sell their businesses than there are people who are wanting to buy their businesses. So we're gonna start seeing a loss of some of these businesses out of community, which for some is okay, right? It's okay that their time has come and we move others, but there's others that when you think in your community, what are the businesses that are core to your community? And if we think ahead of that, is there a way to anticipate and look at those businesses and see if any of those are coming up, provide a social enterprise opportunity for you? Yeah, Reynard. Um, just, I wanted to quickly interject. Um, I'm working with uh, Chris Galloway and Marty Frost and a couple of others on um, starting a consulting company that will work with um, entrepreneurs who are looking to sell their business and are considering selling it to their employees, uh, either to become a worker co-op or some other structure like an ESOP or whatever. Um, and again, we've identified the exact same thing you're seeing here. There's a lot of companies where the owner literally cannot find a buyer. There's nobody out there and the businesses get wound up, jobs get lost, you know, and or, or the or they get taken over by some huge American company, and you know the profits go stateside. So um, that's a big, big opportunity. Um, you know, in our society, is to is to work um, to find ways to help transition um, jobs to the to the employees and or ownership to the employees. What I mean, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, Reynard. Yeah, and there's this whole movement in Canada. I would say that's around what's, what people are calling social acquisitions, and so there's three ways that social acquisitions are are coming from, and one is yeah transition to employee ownership, transition to cooperative, and then the third piece, which is today what we're talking about is transition to nonprofit charitable ownership. And so those three kind of streams, and they all have a really, I think, all of them, all of them, yes. <laughs> so uh, it's great. So there's different ways that you can own your business, right? So you can have a social enterprise within an organization. And this is usually like I talked about in startup is that, or it might be you have a thrift store or you have something that's deeply, deeply aligned to your organization. And that can operate almost like a department within your, within your nonprofit or your charity, right? You then can also have an organization that is a social enterprise. So the social enterprise that I operated was a nonprofit that was a janitorial cleaning business. And so it was, there was no other parent organization. The whole business operated on a revenue-based model. It was just a nonprofit revenue-based model. All our profits went back to support our employee ownership or employee support programming. And then we have one where the, where the organization owns the social enterprise. So this can be, a, this is so an organization, your, your business, your social enterprise might not be mission aligned with yours. Right. So you might be running, you know, um, you might be running a mental health organization and you run a ice cream shop. Right. And your ice cream shop might provide employment. Right. That might be part of it. But that the goal of the ice cream shop might be that it also generates revenues back to pays dividends back to your company or back to your charity. Right. So it can make donations back to the charity or it can make dividends back to your charity. So you have the ability to own your entity and to separate them out. So. This allows, and you can, and, and organizations can own a number of them, as long as you keep them separate and you keep your governance separate at their arm's length and you have the relationship is clearly delimited, then there is permission. So there other are other complex models, but this is um, different ways. And so the one that we're gonna talk about mostly is how you can own another enterprise, right? And this is because that separation, we find that more and more that separation just keeps it really clean in terms of your books, in terms of CRA, in terms of, you know, mandates and mission, but that the organizations begin to talk to each other and begin to benefit from each other. So I'm going to just run through a story of an organization <laughs> that went through an acquisition. And afterwards, we'll send you out the case studies, we'll share out our recording of this, um, and so on. And you can just hop in and this case study has been was done at the beginning has been continued to be added to. And so essentially, this is Port Alberni. Right. So Port Alberni is on Vancouver Island, small community in the center of the island, very beautiful, and um, the has this candy store. This candy store has been owned in the community for 40 years, 
like long time community organization or business. Um, it's right when you drive into Port Alberni on your way to Tofino, if that's your journey, you come into the, the community, it's right at the front of the sort of like welcome gate of, of the community. Um, it provides steady employment, it's a little manufacturing business. So they not only sell as a retail and sell ice cream and so on, but they also manufacture and sell candy to other places across, across the island, right? And so, and this business came up for sale. And the Community Futures, which is a nonprofit that operates and does business development services, um, decided that they wanted to acquire and they wanted to acquire a business that would not only generate revenue, but provide inclusive employment to people in Port Alberni who may face barriers to employment, as well as to provide a training business that they could have people who they're trying to teach business skills, that they had their own business that they could put people in to learn those business skills, to learn entrepreneurial skills. So it really aligned into their mandate. So it was a private sale. It was listed on Venture Connect, um, which is one of the resources that you can have to, to look and look for businesses and see what's coming up. They purchased the business, but not the building or the land underneath it. So they just acquired the business. Um, they used the services of Venture Connect and they concluded that sale on November 1st, 2020, just so you have an idea of the time frame. It took them about six months to, to make that sale, to acquire the business. They um, have incorporated it as a for-profit subsidiary of the nonprofit, and the directors are from both staff and volunteers. So they've combined and put, put the board um, together around that. So they decided to acquire the business for these reasons. They wanted to have that additional revenue source into the community futures that provided control and options. So they really were, they were like, they wanted to generate their own revenue stream. They're very, community futures tend to be very government funded um, and they're, they're federal government funded. And there comes a lot of restrictions around how that revenue can be used, right? And so by creating their own revenue stream, they were able to fill some of the gaps that they were seeing that were outside of the funding agreements that they had. They really wanted to maintain the local ownership of the business. And this is what Raynard's talking about a bit, is that we're seeing this movement of um, bigger companies coming in and beginning to see opportunities of smaller businesses and beginning to acquire. And so when bigger companies from outside of community acquire and own, then the profits leave community. So we begin to see a leaving of profits from community. And so they wanted to maintain the local ownership and keep the employment local and keep the profits local. Um, and they really wanted to have addressed sort of a way for them to also provide and expand their employment opportunities in their in their community. So they worked on that. As I mentioned, they had a, a location of the property, which is in the gateway to the community. And what they didn't know, which they didn't anticipate, was that it would it very much raised as people came in and they went and stopped and had their ice cream and picked up candy and so on, they began to put signage up that talked about what Community Futures does in the community. So it raised the profile of Community Futures as well. So their, their business becomes a bit of a way for them to increase their outreach and increase engagement. And so they had quite a, quite a positive. They really let through their criteria beforehand of what they needed to have to purchase. And so they laid this all out. They really expected that there would be existing staff and management that would continue with the business. So they were not looking for an owner that was going to leave, but they wanted to make sure that there was that transition and that capacity that was already built into the business existed, that they could operate independently. They did not need to have the community future staff run the business, that it was, it was a going concern on its own, that it generated a profit. So they were wanting to make sure that that revenue stream came back in and that they saw potential for growth and scale. And that was really key. They did a business plan. I saw here's a small manufacturing business. We see that we're one of the few manufacturing businesses of candy on the island. And we see the potential of being able to provide and, and grow that manufacturing business so that it supplies product to other, other communities across the island. And Alec has been um, <laughs> poking, poking the community futures whenever she sees an opportunity down in the couch and in her Nanaimo and going, you got to get into this store. And so just through networks, we can see that they're beginning to grow, not only through Alec, but through many people. They're beginning, they saw a plan for growth. They really were wanting to make sure that it could employ people with barriers to employment. So I had a number of different roles and that's where the manufacturing piece was really great for them. It was light manufacturing and people could be not customer facing, but in, in behind and doing the work that they wanted to do. And that provided an opportunity for them to partner with their local employment agencies, to partner with their local disability organizations, to provide greater opportunities for employment. It was really key for them that they wanted to make sure that the barriers to the new market entry was high. So 
there was a lot of equipment that came with the business. So to start that business from scratch should be very expensive, be more expensive to start that business from scratch and to acquire the equipment than to acquire the business and with all the revenue and track record and so on. So they knew there wouldn't be easy to have somebody else come in and, and um, come in a competitive landscape. So that was an important thing for them. And they also just wanted a really well-run business that had a good community reputation. So those are the things that they were looking for. What they brought to their business, because we see that in a number of transitions that we've worked with and in, in the stories and the case studies that they've done, is that when a nonprofit or a charity acquires the business, it puts a new life into that business as well. And so they brought their, their enthusiasm, their vision, their energy, that kind of new ownership feeling, but they also brought really significant skills in terms of human resources, business planning, strategy, you know, all the things that, that as professional organizations that nonprofits or charities are bring to small businesses. And one of the unexpected things that we've noticed in working with this transition is that often small businesses can be run sort of, especially if they're mom and pop shops, they can be run kind of ad hoc, right? And so when a nonprofit acquires, they actually bring all sort of like the professional management that nonprofits have in running your own organizations to that business, to the benefit of that business. So in terms of their pre-purchase, the advice that they give is to communicate to employees as soon as they decide to purchase. So not only to employees in the business and knowing the intentions, because people begin to get nervous and afraid for their jobs and you want to keep the staff, right? And so to communicate really, it's like, it's like you go into communication hyperdrive, it's communication to the people who are in the business, it's communication to the people in your nonprofit, this is why we're doing this, this is what matters, this is how it helps us further our mission, and communication to community. Right. So there's a really, you know, communication of what your intentions are and what the plan is. And that Lori, who tells this story, she's like, we did not we did not um, know how there would be a gap between when they acquired the business and the financing that they needed, including credit cards, because when it came into their ownership, it came into their ownership as a new business and they didn't have a track record. The business also didn't have a track record because it was owned by a sole proprietor. So they needed to sort of ladder and make sure that the business had enough track record and had to apply for all those things to end part of the transition. So she just talks about making sure that you can secure your financing and to plan for that transition part. When they purchased, they made sure that they really established those communications hiring. And this is a communications um, process. And this is the part of moving from like doing it to oversight, like setting up those systems for oversight, being able to, you know, switch utilities to new owners, to implement and put a point of sale system in. She established accounting systems and she made sure that she really clarified the reporting relationship with the previous owners. Because in that transition point, there can be a split between do the staff report to the nonprofit or the new charity or do the staff still report to the owner? Like who's the boss, right? And so for some folks and in some of the transitions we've seen, the owners have stayed on for years, right? So we've we've seen and done case studies where the owner is just tired of being a business owner. They really love their business. They want to they want to still do the work that they want to do. They just don't want to do the business side of it. So for them, there might be a place where they want to go and they move into a management position. And they transition and they stay on as manager, but they don't own the business anymore. For other people, it's a transition period that allows to do the capacity transfer, but then to move the owner out. The very first social enterprise that I operated, which was a cafe, was an acquisition. And we acquired the business um, <laughs> from an existing owner. We transitioned it into a cooperative, um, but that existing traditional owner stayed on as part of the cooperative. And that made it very difficult made it very difficult because in a democratic relationship or the shift we were trying to make, he had outsized influence and it was hard for him to let go of his vision for the business. So depending on the owner and depending on the relationship, it's really important that there's an exit clause that you can see that there's a path out for that business owner. So it's just setting that up and making sure that it works. And so this was, I put this up here, it's a lot to look at. And so we won't, I won't go through it all, but it's just the year one. Right, it's the year one of what it took to transition and all the things that they that they did. Um, some of the things that are interested is, you know, they brought in benefits and benefits package and established wage structures. So this is the piece of bringing employment stability to the existing employees. Um, they used wage subsidies, so they began to tap into that sort of vast knowledge that nonprofits have around around accessing grants and community and so on to be able to build out that that staffing. One of the things that they did, which is um, 
which is quite great. So a lot of the a lot of the staff hadn't had vacation or hadn't had consistent vacation. One of them hadn't been on vacation for more than a week in 10 years. And so Lori, who ran this, said, you know, our goal was to, to find a way that the business to shift people all to like paid vacation to make sure that they were they were taken care of to increase their wages to be fair wages, you know, to really look at that whole structure and to create some structure around that. And, you know, the reason why they weren't able to take vacation, this one person who is the manager hadn't taken vacation in a long time and this, and their ice cream manager hadn't taken vacation for a long time because they didn't have the equipment to have ice cream stay, how do I, ice cream keep for more than a week, right? So she was the person that made the ice cream and she could only go away for a week because they needed her back to make the next batch of ice cream. So their investment that Lori made in the, for one of the first investments say we want to make sure all of our all of our staff could go away for up to three weeks and that the business could run accordingly for that and so they invested in equipment in order to make ice cream that could keep for three weeks so things like that are beginning to think about how they operate and transition that business so this is what it looked like in terms of revenue and profits as you can see in the blue line is the business before they acquired it and the red line is the business after they acquired it so bringing that capacity and bringing those skills and resources and being able to focus on the business in the way that they did, they saw an increase in their revenue. They had a net profit of over $110,000 in September after a year. So they bought it in November. In September, which is their year end, they had a profit of $110,000 that then they were able to decide what to do with that. Um, and they had profit margins of around 34%. So, um, And this, when they came to it, they, they had to think about what did they want to do? And they have options around how they then take that profits and put it back. Do they provide it dividends back to their, back to the core nonprofit? Do they decide to reduce the loan that they took in order to acquire the business? Or did they decide to invest it back into the business? And as I mentioned, part of the reason why they wanted to do is to invest back into the business to, to build new equipment and to add new equipment so that would make their the life better for their for their staff. So they decided to do that with their first years of profits. So in terms of the categories of when thinking about acquiring a business, it's really looking at those these four areas of categories, which is like, what's the strategic alignment? What's the goal of what you're trying to do? Is the business help you further your goal? Does the business help you further your revenue goals? Does it help you further your, you know, your impact goals? What's the strategic alignment with your core enterprise? And as I mentioned earlier with the community futures, they had very strategic alignment and saw this business as being able to achieve those goals. The business model is really key. And there's some business models that are complex and some business models that are simpler. If you're oversight to a business, we recommend that you go with a more simple business model, right? So if you don't understand the business or if it's, you know, if it's really complex, it requires a lot of personal relationship, that kind of thing then that's, that's a more difficult business to, to acquire an oversight. So it's looking at more and less, looking at less complex business models. So, um, and so you'll be able to sort of see them as you go. And as you begin to look into businesses and do your due diligence, you'll get an understanding of the complexity of the business. The management capacity is key. Do they have management that's able to hold and run and operate the business? Do they want to stay on? Are they, you like them? Do they fit? Do they align? Are they excited about the opportunity? and then also the community engagement potential. So these are all ways to look at what is the best way for a business to, you know, to select and identify what the businesses are. So before I move on from that, uh, I just wanted to just open up, does anyone have any questions at this point? And then I'm gonna talk about like processes. Andy? Yes. Oh, how did you know? I, I didn't even get a chance to click the, the, the wave. I see you. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm curious. So in, in this case, Christy, um, did the owner stay on? Is, is that what you were saying in this case, that the owner did stay the on? The owner stayed on for about three months. Yeah. Okay. They stayed on for three months and then, and then they had, but they had really good, strong, they had a store manager who was able to operate and run it. So it really was around the transition of the financials, saying that the accountants, like get, making sure that that initial transition went went through and then the owner was ready to retire. Yeah. Okay, and just, oh, sorry, go ahead, Ray. Or someone else, sorry, I'm not convenient. Oh, I, I just had a quick comment. This is a great workshop. Are you gonna be doing it again later this year? Cause I'd like to invite some friends to attend as well. 
Um, maybe we'll talk about that at the end. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And you had another question? Uh, yeah. So one of the kind, of, I think, so the stumbling blocks that many nonprofit societies have is is how does a nonprofit own a for profit business? Can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, it's similar to it, you set up a separate company and the for profit owns all the shares. So when you have a for profit business, it's shares and you own the shares. And when you make a sale, there's different ways that you can acquire and it gets very technical. And we have resources that can help you walk through that in a more technical and deeper level, including what I'm gonna share in a little bit. But essentially the nonprofit owns the shares, 100% owned. You can even do like 70% own. And if you want, you can invite other people to come in as investors, as co-owners. You may or may not want to do that, but essentially you, you can own, you own shares and then those shares pay dividends. So there's two ways that a for-profit can put essentially take the money out of a for-profit into a nonprofit. They can pay dividends to as an owner, or they can make a, a, a donation. Same as any businesses that want to make a donation to a charity, um, your business can make a donation to your charity. So yeah, Nick, you have a comment or a question? Yeah, uh, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, selling uh, the business. So I'm I'm I own a business and I'm in discussions with a a not-for-profit um, where we are talking about initially working together, but then moving into them acquiring the business as, uh, as we move on. So is there, is there opportunity to have a scaled acquisition, which is outlined and obviously the, the valuation would happen on, uh, on agreed terms, right? Yes, I mean, there's an opportunity to do whatever model makes sense for, for you. I mean, there's, there's ways to scale ownership. There's ways to transition. There's, it's all around the agreements that you set up and, and making sure that that's put on a time frame. And it's very clear. And always in our recommendation around partnerships is that there's an exit clause. People know how they're right. going to get out if it's not right. going to work. Right. Um, and that that is laid out very, very clearly at the front because it's all, it's wonderful at the beginning. Um, and in most of them are wonderful all the way through, but for the some that aren't, you need to make sure that, you know, you know, the transition out. Excellent. I'm looking forward to receiving the recording as well as your workbook so I can uh, send talk. Unfortunately, the, the other person is, is, is traveling, so uh, she wasn't able to join, but uh, great program. Thank you very much. And, and, I, and I agree, Rena, you know, let us know if you're going to be having it again. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming, Nick. So this is the acquisition process map that was developed. And you can see at the top, we have sellers, you know, they plan, to, to they're like, okay, I'm ready to get out. I'm going to get prepared to sell. And then they're sell and then they exit or the key owner and staff remains. Now for the buyer, which is nonprofit or charity to acquire, there's a process. There are plan process. It takes care of that time issue that I talked about. So understanding, doing your alignment of the value. What are you looking for? What are the criteria? Really laying that out and understanding the risk. So we, there's a risk mitigation process. And this is outlined in the workbook that we're going to show you in a second. Then it's like, okay, what's your search? What And sometimes this comes as an opportunity, right? Someone, some of the businesses that we've seen and supported through acquisition, the owner came and approached the nonprofit said, hey, I'm thinking about leaving. Would you want to take it on? And so sometimes this comes, the search doesn't happen, but sometimes, you know, these, I was going to say plan and search can be interchanged in that um, you never know what comes. But it's really looking at, there's lots of resources that are out there that, that can help see what's going on in communities and what's up for sale. And you know, for Community Futures, they looked on Venture Connect, which is a search engine. They found a business, they went through that process. There's also just being in community and seeing which businesses do you think are really core to your community that you have an affinity to. And if you can see that that owner is looking like they're ready to move on, it's worth a conversation. And so we've seen businesses that come that way, both sort of owners approaching nonprofits, but also nonprofits going, hey, when you are thinking about, you know, retiring or if you want to, you know, shift out of your business, we'd be interested in having a conversation. So there's all different ways of finding it. But understanding your criteria up front is critical. So you take the emotion out of the business, you're able to assess the business on its own by creating that criteria beforehand and then deciding, does this business meet our criteria? All right. We worked with the business. Um, uh, an organization that was acquiring a business and they made an offer uh, before they did their criteria or had the business assessed. So 
the emotion got in there because they really wanted the business and they felt like this is something that's key to our community. We want to keep it and so on. And now they're in a bit of a challenge because they over offered. And so by setting up those things in place, making sure that you have that beforehand, you can do that even like a year or two before you want to acquire or you're thinking about it, but setting up that criteria because sometimes you don't know what comes your way and you don't know what's going to pop up. And so by having it sitting there in your drawer allows you to be able to assess quickly if that's something you want to consider or not. And that's a really, really critical piece. So we spend a lot of time talking about planning because the rest of the things begin to go on their own pathway, right? There's already predetermined pathways for doing search, assess, invest. These things are, you follow, you, you get your accountants, your lawyers, you don't always need a lawyer, but you get your accountants and you begin to go through this process. And um, when you go to the assess, you really want to make sure you understand the business. So you'll be able to enter into like a non-disclosure agreement with existing businesses and be able to look at how they're doing, what their financials are, where they're at, you know, have good conversations with the owner and get a sense of whether or not this is, this is something that you're interested in. And again, there's great checklists and resources that will be in the workbook that can help you know exactly what information you need to do in order to assess. And we really recommend for nonprofits and charities that if you're looking at doing an acquisition process, you, you create a little subworking group, three to four people whose job it is to walk through the due diligence process. And then they can report back to the board. They can report back to staff and to usher that through, but that they have, they have the, the task to, to go through that process together. Then we have the invest part, which is making the offering and lining up your financing. Um, and there's a bunch of different ways that you can finance it. And I think on Tuesday, Thrive Impact Fund did a, a webinar, a 30 minute webinar on financing to acquire, which dug into the different types of financing that you can access in order to acquire. Um, so I recommend checking that out if you want to dig more into the types of financing. And then this is this launch part, which is, you know, it becomes it's for, for you, the business is already there, but once it's yours, you're almost like relaunching it. Right. And so this is the management transition, the change management, creating those, those oversight systems and really understanding cash flow. And this is another part that we see as a transition for nonprofits is the way our money comes into our organizations tends to be in chunks, right? Chunks. And it sort of has a bit of a longer, longer lead time. And you sort of manage from, from, I'm going to say a bird's eye view a bit more with a business. You're looking at a weekly, monthly cash in and cash out situation. So being able to understand cash and the cash flows of that business help you transition and, and understand it. And that's really key for that, especially that first year where you're getting to know the ebbs and flows of the business. However, your the business should have tracked the past financials that will give you insight into that before you go. And then the beautiful part, which is transitioning to this business to social purpose. And as we saw from that example from Community Futures, there's a lot of things that begin to transition and benefits that bring both to the business and to your organization in that. And you begin to look at things like, how do we make our business more sustainable? How do we make our business more in community and begin to contribute? What are the employment opportunities that our business provides to vulnerable members in our community? Like there's layers and layers and layers of ways that a business can transition and become that fully functioning and um, operating social enterprise. And a lot of small businesses are already doing so many great things. And so this is just taking your lens of what you know around community and impact and people and planet and, and putting that into a business as well. There is a, you can grab this from both from the Venture Connect website, it's posted on there because we adapted their workbook that they created and adapted it specifically to nonprofits and charities. So this answers some of those questions around how do you own, what is the share process, you know, what are the sale process, what are the ways that, you know, we put in a lot around the planning and transitioning around setting out your alignment, understanding, you know, some of the regulations, the CRA regulations around owning a business um, are all in there. So um, recommend, <clears throat> you know, checking it out. It's got stories, it's got, you know, worksheets and it's meant to be sort of a, it's meant to be a fillable PDF workbook, um, which will guide a lot of this. And then we also are um, considering operating or launching our second version of an incubator. So last year we did an incubator with, with uh, five organizations on Vancouver Island um, to help them look at and getting acquisition ready. And this is the process of the program that we did. We did it over eight weeks, and I think we'll do it in a shorter time frame. Each of the sessions is an hour and a half, and so we might do a shorter time frame because people were ready to go, right? We were just like, oh, and when the program starts holding people back, it's time to put the program on, on hyperspeed and then make it a little more condensed. So people are ready to go and interested and excited, and it brings together board, staff, um, leadership to be able to talk about and get ready for that acquisition process. 
And so we start with, you know, similar to this, like what is your goals and alignment and your purpose of, of a community acquisition? You know, what is the risk that you, that you face and the risk for your organization into there and how to, how to assess risk? Um, we talk about building out an acquisition roadmap and each of these bring in um, speakers, really good speakers who tell their stories, but also bring in some of that expertise that's required around that. How to search, assess, to find that business match, how to go through your due diligence process, including specifically how to understand financials and look at the valuation of a business. Um, and then we do a session on financing and ways to finance your acquisition. Um, and then buying the business, the specific legal and governance considerations that you'll need to take into consideration in how you own the business as a nonprofit or charity. And then the last one's around transitioning to social enterprise. So that is coming up. And so um, I think that that's, yeah, that's, so that's coming up. We're, yes, like I said, we're considering hosting it and part of doing this to get a sense of if we hosted <laughs> another one of these, is that something of interest? Um, do you know of other community members that you think would be interested would want to run it with probably same kind of number, I would say like five to seven uh, nonprofits and charities to be able to come in and, and go through the acquisition process. So at this point, I will open it up to general questions, as well as Alec is going to pop into SurveyMonkey, just a quick questions around, you know, who you are, you know, what do you think, what information are you looking for? Um, and then we can follow up on that as well. So feel free to, yeah, answer any questions that you have. Or, um, and here we've got separation. Yes, thank you. Rob is talking about that separation and arm's length is key to ownership. Um, and I wanna make sure that I am, haven't missed others. I think Nick, you talked about the 100% ownership part. And yeah, yeah. Any other questions or thoughts or things that you're sort of thinking about what you might wanna do as a next step? Christy, Cheryl, um, yeah. I'm, I'm a little bit familiar with Venture Connect. Um, do you know of um, other sources of businesses for sale that would be valuable or? Yes, there's a lot um, in our, in our um, scanning around. It depends on where you are, but you know, there's, there's brokers, there's business brokers. We have one in Victoria called Chinook. You know, there, if you start looking at those business brokers, there's a really good one in Alberta that's emerging called Village Wealth. That is, you know, aiming to be a, a um, national um, social acquisition um, broker. Um, so I think there's, there's other ones that I've sometimes get contact, got contacted by one called uh, Diamond that, that reached out from Nanaimo. So there, there are business brokerage or selling brokerage and, and those exist. I think that um, the probably, I think that Venture Connect and those organizations are really good for looking and seeing what's out there and to gain a sense of sense of the market. Like that's what it lets you know is kind of, okay, that's the market. This is how much cafes kind of are asking for. This is what it costs to acquire a, a manufacturing. Like you can get a really good sense of that. Okay. And like, and so they're, they're great for understanding that. I do think when in the reality of what we see is that the reasons for selling are many, the ways that they can be sold are diverse, especially to nonprofits because they might, some of it might be, um, a donation, right? You can have donation of some other businesses for, for receipts. Like there's different ways that, that that transition can happen. That sometimes a sale price on a business doesn't always tell the whole, whole truth or it might not be how it, how it happens. Um, and so for us, we've seen that the most successful or the most common way of nonprofits acquiring has been that they see the business next door comes up for sale. <laughs> it's one that they know the owner, they've had a relationship for a long time, the owner cares about their legacy and community, which is why this is called business legacies is because a lot of these owners care about their legacy and community and their employees. And so there becomes a conversation, and it becomes about how do we make this happen? Right, that, right. that tends to be yeah. what I see almost all of the businesses um, that we've worked with, and we've worked with about five in the last year. Mm -hmm. But who you know, it is still such a powerful thing. And yeah. what you know, just by experiencing, seeing what's happening next door, and yeah. you feel for the demand and the type of service. And 
Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Any other thoughts or questions? So you can always reach out to Alec and I. <laughs> we're we're um, excited about this project. We're excited to <clears throat> to um, let me just make sure I didn't yeah, miss anything. Um, yeah, we're excited about this project. We're excited to to run another incubator. We're excited to. I mean. The group of people is great, but we're also really excited to to see and realize this possibility that I think exists at this time specifically for our communities. And we do see that there is this kind of raising awareness. And so we try to just get out to all organizations to just say, you know, if you're considering a social enterprise, you know, and a lot of organizations are, then as part also put acquisition on your consideration. Um, and I would say, and the and one of the main reasons why we do that is because. The, the steadiness, the knowledge, the capacity, the information that you get through an acquisition process has a greater chance of success for that business, right? So startup is totally makes sense if it's your own idea, if it's innovative, if it's new and so on, that totally makes sense. Um, and that's part of those considerations. Um, but in terms of success and overall business success, um, acquisition has a bit of a better track record. So, um, so thank you all for joining and uh, yeah, we hope that you have a wonderful day. <laughs>